This video lecture is on the other senses. We are still a part of Unit 1, Sensation and Perception portion. The focus today is on Module 1.6D. So in this module um, video lecture, we're going to talk about um, taste, smell, body position, and touch. So we're going to kind of cover all of those um, together in one. So first of all, our tongue, as you can see here, um, we have all these dots on our tongue, which many of us refer to as our taste buds, but they're not actually our taste buds. They are um, actually what's called fungiform papillae. And inside these papillae is, um, or these bumps in the tongue is where the taste buds reside, reside, um, reside pardon me. Um, and each of those have little receptor cells. So as you can see here, here's the little fungiform papillae or that tiny little dot. If you go underneath it is where you can see all of these different receptor cells that help to um, give us the taste buds or allow us to receive the chemical of taste. There have always been thought that there are four different um, tastes on our tongue, sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. But we have more recently found that there is a fifth scent, a fifth um, taste bud, which is called umami, which is for things that are like savory, and they help us to respond to things like um, MSG and things like that. Um, spicy, um, although we can experience things being spicy, it's not actually one of the areas in our tongue that we actually um, are able to have receptors for. However, what it does do is that it uses something called capsation, which is the really spicy part or that, that colored line, the really spicy part that makes pepper so hot. It uses capsation, and what happens is it opens up what are called heat receptors on our tongue, and it actually almost like it burns us, and it sends a kind of a message to our brain that something is burning, and that gives us what we experience as spicy. So it's not actually a taste bud. It's actually... Um, hurting us is what happens. Um, the next one is smell. And smell is, again, we have odor molecule, molecules that go into our nose. Those odor molecules kind of attach to receptor cells, which are called cilias. Sounds similar to cilias that are in the ear. Um, these are these receptor cells in the membrane. You can see right here, all of these are cilias or the cells that receive the odor molecules. These odor um, these little receptor cells um, or cilias are on top of what's called the olfactory bulb. So you can compare the olfactory bulb to something like the cochlea or the retina. And the cilias is just like, or those receptors are just like the rods and the cones or just like the cilias in the ear. So as you can guess, those cilias or those receptor cells in the olfactory membrane are responsible for that process of transduction or transformation from one form to another. So it transforms odor molecules and turns it into a neural message that our brain can process. Once it's been turned into a neural message, it travels down that olfactory nerve, which sounds a lot like optic nerve and auditory nerve because it's the same thing. It's that kind of highway between the sense the nose, the eye, the ear, and the brain where it gets processed. I want you to guess, once it goes down that olfactory nerve, where does it go next? I hope you are not saying that it goes to the thalamus because we know the thalamus takes in all senses except for smell and sends them where they need to go. So instead, it's a direct line straight from the olfactory nerve right to the brain where it um, is processed. It is processed near the hippocampus, kind of between the temporal and the frontal lobe. And that's why smell really gives us um, a lot of memories. Because it's processed near that hippocampus, it brings back memories for us. So oftentimes when we smell, um, say, an apple pie, it may make us think of being at our aunt's house who makes a fabulous apple pie. Or we smell um, a certain odor that is because our boyfriend or girlfriend wore our sweatshirt that day. That odor will remind us of that person. Well, that's because smell is processed near that hippocampus, and so it can, has the ability to bring back lots and lots of memories. Um, I should go back here and let you know that um, taste is processed um, near um, 
in the temporal lobe. So it's processed close to where smell is. And that's why in order to experience flavor, we need that combination of taste and smell to experience um, flavor in the mouth. And they are processed near each other. So they allow us to be able to um, experience those two things together. The last two senses I want to talk about is our kinesthesia sense and our vestibular sense. Um, so our um, kinesthesia sense is kind of our sense of our body position and movement. So it helps us to be able to know where our body is relative to the other parts of our body. So if I asked you to close your eyes and to take your finger and touch your nose, you could probably do so. Or close your eyes and put your hands on your waist or close your eyes and clap your hands. You can thank your kinesthesia or kinesthetic sense for that because it allows you to be able to know where your um, parts of your body are relative to the other parts of your body. The second sense is our vestibular sense, and this is our sense of balance. This helps us to be able to know um, where our head and body position is, to help us keep our equilibrium, to stay upright. It also is what causes us to feel dizzy when we're spinning a lot of times or when we're running in circles. And we can thank this fancy little thing up here in the ear called our semicircular canal. So you can see here from our other video lecture, here's that oval window, opens into that cochlea, right? Uh, right next to that, kind of right above those three tiny bones, is something called the semicircular canal, which has nothing to do with hearing, and that's why it's not in our hearing video. It actually has everything to do with our vestibular sense. This is a fluid-filled canal, and what happens is if you imagine holding a water bottle filled with water, and when you run in a circle or spin in a circle, imagine taking that water bottle and spinning it in a circle, and then when you stop, you'll notice that that water is still moving, Similarly, in this fluid-filled area in the semicircular canal, when you spin in a circle, that water that's inside there, that fluid that's inside there is, is spinning and moving, and it takes a second till it settles back down like the water in the water bottle takes a second to settle back down before you get your equilibrium or your balance back. This is also sometimes why when you get ear infections, sometimes you can feel a little bit dizzy. Um, a lot of times because you have so much um, liquid and backup in your ear caused by the ear infection that it can kind of throw off your vestibular sense. It can make those semicircular canals. There's just too much fluid happening in there that it can make us feel a little bit um, unbalanced. Or if you've ever known anyone who experiences vertigo, vertigo is very much, they look at the first place they look at is those semicircular canals. Is there something going on in there that's causing the vertigo to occur? The next sensation we are going to be talking about is touch. And when we think about touch, we um, are talking about anything that's like a, it's, it's our tactile sense. Touch is very vital for our well-being. Touch aids in our development. It allows hormones to be released. It impacts our metabolic rate. It regulates our body temperature. There's so much that touch does in order to um, allow us to survive. And we're going to focus in on this a little bit more during our development unit it, regarding how does touch especially help um, infants and young children to be able to survive and thrive. Uh, but the direction we want to go in this video lecture is talking about touch and how it relates to pain. And pain is very important because it's our body's way of letting us know that there's some type of problem. So for example, if we get burned, it lets us know we need to move our hands so we don't burn our hand off. If we break or sprain an ankle, it lets us know to stop and to change our behavior. And so um, pain is really important part of touch to understand um, because we need it in order to protect ourselves and to save ourselves. So one of the theories related to pain is called the gate control theory. And this theory explains how do we, via touch, um, experience pain. So the first thing to keep in mind with this is that pain is a signal. Okay, so when you hurt yourself, like you touch a hot stove or you twist your ankle, your body sends a signal to your brain saying, ow, that hurts. <laughs> um, and so I want you to imagine like a gate on a back door of um, like a, a fence, okay? A gate that um, decides if that out signal gets to go through and enter into the brain or not enter into the brain. So we have this gate control theory that we have a gate that can either open or close. When the gate is open, we're allowed to feel more pain and we let that pain go into our brain so that we can process it. When that gate is closed, we feel less pain. And so research has found that there's some things that impact whether those gates get opened 
or they get closed when we hurt ourselves, when we have pain that occurs. So some of the things that can affect the gait, um, number one is rubbing or touching the hurt area. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but you know, if you hurt yourself, sometimes your, your parent or your loved one will come over and like um, push on where that pain is and kind of rub it, or you might actually do that. Like you hurt your ankle and you just start to, to rub and massage that ankle. When you rub that sore spot, that can help close a gate, making the pain feel less intense. As also kind of a trick, if you are a person who absolutely hates getting shots, you can do this to help you feel less pain in a shot, where if you actually just rub your fingers um, over your um, like over your skin, right where you're going to be near where you're going to get that shot, and you just keep rubbing your skin over and over while you're getting that shot, it kind of confuses that, that gate control system, and it doesn't let the pain in of the shot as much as if you weren't doing that. Something that else that affects that gate is how you're feeling. If you're really stressed or you're anxious, your gait is more likely to be more open, so you feel more pain. If you're relaxed or distracted, the gate might be closed and you feel less pain. That's why they talk about, um, especially like in birthing classes, they talk about getting yourself into the right state of mind, because if you can get yourself into a, a meditative state or a relaxed state, you can actually lessen the pain that you are feeling. So kind of the conclusion we've gained from this goat control theory is that pain isn't just about what happens to our body. It's also about how the brain feels and reacts to it. And so whether or not that gate opens or closes when pain happens makes it much different how much pain we experience. One other thing that happens is the brain can actually sometimes create pain as well without something external happening. So the gate control theory really helps us to understand that when something external happens, how that gate opens or closes to let it into our brain. But our brain also has the ability to create pain. And we know this through looking at individuals who have what's called phantom limb pain. It's a really interesting phenomenon that, that happens to individuals who um, are amputees, but where they actually feel phantom limb sensation. So somebody who doesn't actually have a hand, but they might um, try and pick up a cup because they feel the sensation of their hand, even though it doesn't exist. Or maybe they feel pain in their foot, even though their foot has been amputated. Or they might try and step off a bed when they don't have a limb anymore, to feel that, um, that sensation. So it's very fascinating how much it doesn't necessarily have to be external, but we can also have internal pain or sensations that happen from the brain um, out to our body. So the last piece of this module is on sensory interaction. So we've had a chance to talk about all five of these senses, touch, taste, smell, sight, and sound. And we know these senses interact with one another. Right? We know especially that our smell and taste work together for us to experience flavor. We know vision and hearing oftentimes interact together. So for example, if you think about like an ump at a baseball game, he might use his sound to hear when the ball hits a player's glove, use that information to judge also the visual of the player running to the base to determine whether or not a runner is safe or out. And so all of our senses work together for us to understand and interpret the environment around us. But there's something interesting that happens when those brain circuits kind of go awry or when these brain circuits that process all of our senses become joined with one another. And we find a very interesting that happens called thing called synesthesia that occurs in um, individuals where their senses have become joined and stimulation of one sense triggers an experience of another sense. So when you have a stimulation of hearing, you only hear. But if those brain circuits become joined, hearing something might cause you or evoke a taste to happen or evoke you to see something or to feel something. So synesthesia is a very interesting case. We're going to look more about it in class. But just when we have um, these senses, this sensory interaction that occurs because our senses become joined and those wires get crossed and we may, um, we may see something and that evokes a taste 
or a color sensation, we have this sensory interaction that occurs. That is it for today. We'll start there when you come back.